published a picture book entitled The Birthday Cake for George Washington by Raymond Dana Shran with illustrations by Vanessa Gladney Media. The social media response, as well as the responses of trade journals, took issue with the representation, once again, of happy slaves. The editor, Andrew Davis Pinckney, a prominent African-American editor and author, responded by delineating the thought processes behind both the text and images used in the book. The author responded with a post on the Children's Book Council website. Read the comments, they are most illuminating. The publisher responded by pulling the book from distribution. Scholastic is announcing today that we are stopping the distribution of the book, A Birthday Cake for George Washington, and will accept all the terms. While we have great respect for the integrity and scholarship of the author, illustrator, and editor, we believe that without more historical background on the evils of slavery than this book for younger children can provide, the book may give a false impression of the reality of life of slaves and therefore should be withdrawn. The book is not available, and the discussion is effectively ended. Again, there are two issues here and they're being conflated. The problem with the representation of slavery in a children's picture book and the withdrawal of the book from distribution. There are currently innumerable articles, columns, blog posts about the issues surrounding diversity in literature for youth. In one blog post, Melinda Lowe, author and co-founder of Diversity and Why We Hate It, writes about white people jumping on the diversity bandwagon familiar echo of discussion that had been had decades before. The Daily Beast has a clickbait article titled The Unbelievably Racist World of Classic Children's Literature. The National Coalition Against Censorship has quite a lot to say about Scholastic pulling the birthday cake. And the Reading Wall White Blogspot doggedly attempts to address the issues as clearly as possible from a professional library standpoint. There is no lack of discussion. We have been having this discussion for the last 60 years. The arc of history may bend toward justice, but sometimes it just takes too long. I could talk to you about how authors and illustrators of color are poorly represented in book publishing, about the refusal to recognize privilege even when it bites us, about how quantitative data about the demographics of the United States simply do not support business as usual. But instead, I'm going to talk to you about the power of story, and by extension, the transformative power of I teach a course in young adult literature. It is notorious in the size of its reading list. Still, there is a fair amount of freedom of choice regarding what each student chooses to read. Four books out of the recommended six, usually. For a course of this depth and breadth, there are surprisingly few required readings. That is, few books that everyone has to read. There is two weeks worth of historical titles, placeholders in the field, including Maureen Daly's The 17th Summer of Everybody Day. There is one title on human sexuality. It's perfectly normal. A groundbreaker when it was originally published and a groundbreaker now. And there is Julius Lester's 2005 Day of Tears, a historical fiction title told in dialogue and monologue, set in the three days of the largest slave auction in American history, which took place in Savannah, Georgia in 1859. Lester's Day of Tears is the book. It's the book that raises issues of privilege and racism and causes tremendously emotional and revealing discussion in my classroom. I am continually amazed by the willingness of my students to listen to one another, to talk about issues that are inherently difficult to discuss, to listen to one another's stories without judgment or anger. My goal in this class is to make sure everyone is safe, but my students are, for the most part, in charge. Toward the end of one particular discussion, I found myself articulating something I have been taught by my students from the responses to and discussion of this book. Art is powerful. Art moves the individual from one level of consciousness to another. The story is everything. It is only through experiencing emotional empathy through story that we change in our heart of hearts, draw closer together, and become true travelers on this human path. Do not get bogged down in the enormity of this discussion. It is very big. It is very big. It is decades <coughs> old. Do not get bogged down. Act. Practical advice addressing this issue has already been given by those whose names should at least now be familiar to you. Katie Horning and Joko Yokoda in separate articles and blog posts have encouraged the purchasing, reading, and promotion of literature
literature by diverse authors and illustrators. This is concrete advice and can be acted upon immediately. You know how I like concrete advice. But I would like to take that practical advice a step further. I would like to suggest to you a shift in policy and embracing a radical inclusivity as the underlying philosophy of collection design. No longer is it a question of whether library collections should be inclusive or whether this is the right time for it to happen. A moral imperative demands inclusivity. To not have an inclusive collection is to misrepresent the world and to poorly serve your community. Commit to a collection development philosophy of inclusivity. Your service community is larger than geography would have it. The children and young adults in your community do not just belong to the geographic parameters defined by tax support. If the walls of the library have fallen to technology, then the community has spilled beyond those walls to the greater world. Our collection should reflect that community consistently and with intention. Inclusivity must be the driving philosophy behind collections, programming, and service. To not represent the world in all its glorious complexity does a distinct disservice to the individuals we serve. To misrepresent the myriad variety of the world in our collections and recommendations is to shortchange our patrons and make their world smaller and dimmer. Art is supposed to make the world bigger, not smaller. My last follow-up speech talked about the power of story to persuade to teach empathy to affect change. That power is at your disposal. It sits waiting on your shelves. All you have to do is recognize it and act. Remember what Roseanne Marlin said, nobody gives you power, you just take it. The task is enormous and the issue is complex, but you can do something now, tomorrow, when you go back to your libraries, your collections, your communities. Embrace radical inclusivity in all arenas of your library. Who has the power to affect change? You do. All you have to do is reach out.